All right, hello and welcome to all on this, this glorious spring day. I was, I was uh, sitting up there in my office right, just right before the service start, kind of putting the, well, a few little last minute finishing touches on the PowerPoint and stuff. And I, I look out my window and here comes Randy rolling into the church parking lot in his little Volkswagen convertible. The top is down. You know, his, his, his shiny dome just <laughs> glinting in them. I almost had to avert my eyes. It was so dazzling. And I knew right then, you know what? Spring has sprung in the Pacific Northwest. And this is a wonderful day for us to be gathered together here to, to fellowship with each other, to, to, to worship and to open up the, this, this word of God, this, this letter that Paul sent to the Thessalonians. And I'm also pleased to say that, that when we're looking at this particular passage we're looking at in the letter today, 1 Thessalonians 2, we're looking at verses 13 through 16. I, in terms of tone, in terms of uh, Paul's goal in this, in terms of what he wants to accomplish, what we have here is an equally joyful and sunshine and bluebirds passage to match the weather. At least, at least that's how it starts out, okay? Um, we're, here's, here's how Paul starts things this morning. We read verse 13 right here, chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians. Here's, here's what Paul writes. He says, And we also thank God constantly, also because he's been given thanks a lot in this letter, particularly at the beginning. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you, the Thessalonian Christians, when you received the word of God, a.k.a. the gospel, not the word of God, meaning the Bible as a whole there, but the gospel, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as, as the word of, of men, meaning like a message of human origin with, with human authority behind it, but as what it really is, the word of God, meaning this message from God about how uh, all people anywhere can be reconciled to God, for, uh, to God through Jesus Christ. This is the gospel which is at work in you believers, or possibly there, who is at work in you uh, believers. There's some ambiguity there in the Greek in terms of the pronoun, whether that should be which or, or who there, but either way, God is the one who is at work, either you know personally is the emphasis or through his word, and either way, Paul is expressing just deep joy right here, the joy of seeing that God's work through the gospel is bearing fruit in Thessalonica and that because of that, Paul's labor there was not in vain. It was worth it. This is, this is a nagging fear of, of the apostle Paul, one that you know, shows up over and, and over again in his letters. It's probably what he would be thinking about when he was on his, his voyages across the sea and lying on the deck looking at the stars at night or when he's getting up early to go cut leather in his workshop and make tents. This would be on his mind. It would be kind of a, a nagging worry that his labor might turn out to be in vain, that, that all this work is, as, a, as an apostle, his toil that he described so vividly in the passage right before it. This is, you know, his work night and day, as we talked about last week, laboring to, to share this message of Jesus whenever, however he can, by whatever means possible, that all that would turn out to be empty, fruitless, in vain. Praise be to God, this is not the case in Thessalonica. And that is why Paul is so happy here. This is why, as he puts it, he is thanking God constantly, constantly. Now, I want you to notice right here the two aspects that prompt this Thanksgiving for Paul, chronologically speaking, the two things. Paul thanks God for what has happened in the past, and then he thanks God for what's happening right now. He thanks God for... Uh, their initial reception of the gospel, how when Paul first shared with them the good news about Jesus to these, you know, Thessalonian pagans who don't know about Jesus or anything about that, how they then accepted that message, not as the word of men, but the word of God when he, you know, first shared that. But then he also thanks God for what God's doing right now in them, present tense through the gospel, which as he puts it, is at work in you believers, is. This is an ongoing thing past tense and present tense. Paul is overjoyed when he thinks about Thessalonica and that just the new life that is springing up all over the place among the Christian community. He's, you know, I, are there any bulb planters in here? Any people who are like, yeah, Tom is, that surprises me, but I like that. You know, my mother-in-law, last, last fall, my mother-in-law, she, she labored in our garden for days around our house. She was 
you know, planting all these bulbs in the cold fall rain and muddy soil. And then guess what? Right now, when I walk around our garden, I see new life springing up all over the place. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. Her labor was not in vain. And that is what, that joy is what Paul is experiencing right now. Just the thrill of seeing this new life that he labored, that he was a part of God's work. And even more thrilling for Paul you know, as he writes this, is his knowledge that this has not been an easy set of circumstances that these Thessalonian Christians have been in. He says, you received the word in much affliction. That's what he writes right at the beginning of this letter. Much antagonism, much uh, hostility. That was kind of the environment. He's going to make note of this again today, how these Thessalonians are going through suffering right now. And there's more suffering for them that probably lies ahead. And yet still they are growing. Still he can see the signs that God is at work in them through his word. So I guess maybe a better analogy than, you know, seeing bulbs come up after the first time you planted them. A better analogy is Paul's kind of like a farmer who's, who's looking at the trees in his orchard and he sees the fruit forming on them in the fall, even though he knows the whole previous year had been a year of drought and a hot summer and a long cold winter with tons of snow. Despite the adverse conditions, they are bearing fruit. And this is beautiful. That's what makes them uh, so happy. And this is why Paul wants to see that growth continue. He wants that growth to keep going. Here's how I put it in your passage today. This is Paul's goal in the rest of our passage, the next few verses, to encourage the Thessalonian Christians to stay faithful in persecution, to stay faithful, not to become faithful. You know, this is uh, not the kind of kick in the behind kind of correction that Paul has to give in some of his other letters to other churches that aren't where they're supposed to be, but this is him encouraging them, cheering them on to stay faithful, to keep growing and to keep thriving in the face of persecution like they already have been, like they already are right now. That's the that's kind of message, the passage that we have before us today. Paul the gardener is going to want to spread fertilizer around the roots of this already growing and healthy church to keep it growing and healthy despite the adverse conditions, despite these adverse harsh conditions that will likely persist into the future, as Paul sees it. What Paul says in the next couple of verses, it's intended to keep that good growth growing. And I really think that is the value of, of this passage for us today, right here at Fellowship Bible Church. You know, many, many Christians that I talk to, I've talked to a number of Christians just about this in the last few weeks. Uh, they feel a sense of anxiety about, about the future and about the future of church life, you know, right here in the Pacific Northwest or the United States as a whole. Kind of this, really a sense of dread when they think about the conditions that we, we might be facing. You know, they read the signs in our culture. Maybe you can even just read the signs in your neighbor's front yard or see the flags that they're flying on the flagpoles. And you know that, you know what? Uh, faithful Christian belief is being viewed with increasing suspicion by many in our culture, increasing antagonism or hostility even in, in ways it hasn't been in, in recent years. So I know some of you and some of the people that I talked to had felt this hostility personally. From, from coworkers when they found, wait, wait, you're a follower of Jesus. Do you believe X, Y, and Z? And then, they, you know, they feel that hostility. Or maybe from some of your family members that you've talked to about this, extended family at gatherings or, 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 or whatever, that you just know that, you know, the way things are trending right now, things, things could get worse. Things could get more hostile for us, uh, not less. So, so what would Paul say to us? as a Christian community right here in Tacoma. But what, what, what sort of things would he say to our church to spread fertilizer on our roots, to keep us going in the face of hostility, harsh conditions that may be getting harsher? Well, that's what Paul gives us right here in these verses. I, I, two key truths is how I put it uh, in your handout. What I see is, you know, two things he emphasizes here. There's many more that you could read elsewhere in the New Testament, but these are the two that Paul zeroes in on right here. Two important reminders that can keep the Thessalonians growing and faithful in the face of this hostility. Two truths that can do the same for us here when we hear them, when we believe them, when we let them sink into our roots. So I want to zero in on those right now. We're going to go right now. We're going to read the rest of the passage, actually, verses 14 through 16. There's 
You know, there's not a whole lot of verses in this passage today, but boy, there is a lot in them. So I'm gonna just read the rest right now. Here's what Paul writes. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displease God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. So I know it feels like the passage took a turn right here. Paul starts out with all the sunshine, bluebirds, Thanksgiving, and now, whoa, we're ending on a thing of wrath. It's getting pretty dark all of a sudden. And and I'll say even more, you know, before we dive into all the encouragement of this, because there is a lot of good, rich encouragement, those two key truths and stuff, before we get into that, uh, I I want to provide a little bit more context for what Paul's saying here, because I know this can sound harsh to modern ears. Maybe you're here and you're not you're not a follower of Jesus yet, and you and and this just sounds like fire and brimstone, terrible stuff to you. Well, I want to. It might even actually sound racist, because I was thinking about you know Paul. He aims all this at the Jews there, right? Again, that can sound really terrible. Is Paul trying to be racist here? Is he just someone who hates? Uh, Jews, and he's trying to slam them. This is just coming out of him here. Well, I want to provide a little bit more context before the, of, of this before we get into the two points. So uh, just five considerations right here, five things for you to consider, I think, to, to better understand where Paul is coming from with what he says in these verses right here. And number one, I think this is the first and most important consideration for us to, to understand this better, is Paul is not talking about all Jews here as a race. That's very important. He's not talking uh, about all Jewish people as an ethnicity. He's talking about some specific Jews who did some specific things, all those those sins that are listed off uh, in verse 15, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and, and, and all of that. These are the Jews he's talking about here, not all Jews everywhere. And I, I in fact, this is, this is kind of a little translation sort of thing. I don't think that there should be a comma there Uh, between verses 14 and 15. I think that actually really muddies the water. Remember, Greek text of these these letters, the letter to Thessalonica, did not have any punctuation. Okay, it was, there was no punctuation when Paul wrote this. He didn't write the comma there. That's that's something that, you know, translators add for the sake of clarity. But I actually think this one uh, does not help with clarity because I think that the comma obscures the fact that Paul is talking about a specific group of Jews here, not the Jews in general, but specifically the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and they did, they did all these things, right? It's, it's a, a, a subset within a larger group, not the, the group as a whole, which corresponds as well to Paul talking about the churches in Judea, which is another subset within a larger group. So he's not talking about all Christians everywhere. He's talking about these specific churches in Judea who suffered these specific things from this specific group of Jews. So Paul is not slamming, you know, all Jews everywhere as as a racist might. He's critiquing a specific group for their specific behavior against a specific group of people, just like you know, this is the, the, that's the focus there. So consideration number one is that. He's not slamming all Jews everywhere. Consideration number two, remember that Paul himself is a Jew as he writes this. He is, he is a Jew. This, I mean, this is so important to remember. This is not, you know, the angry racist rant of a non-Jewish person just critiquing the Jews because he hates them. What we're reading here, I mean, the, these are the passionate words of a very Jewish person person, a Hebrew of, 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 of Hebrews, you know, with all of the Jewish street cred that anyone could ask for. Paul lists this off in one of his, his other letters, basically, you know, proving his, his Jewishness. He has all the Jewish street cred, and he is calling out his own people because he loves the Jewish people, and he expects much better of them. There's a long tradition of this within um, Judaism, not, not just in the Bible, but even afterwards, that most of the harshest critiques, of they, they come from within. You know, read, read the Old Testament, read the prophets. These Jewish prophets that are just full of very harsh words from God against their own people because they know the standard to which they should live. You see this in other groups today as well, that many of the harshest groups of any subset or subculture or, or ethnicity or any of these other things, often the harshest critiques of them come from within come from themselves. And that's what we're seeing here with Paul. So that's important to remember. He is a Jew. Consideration number three, 
you got to remember that some of the recipients of this letter were also Jewish that he's writing to in Thessalonica. Not, not all the Thessalonian Christians were Jewish, but a portion of them were. We read back in you know, uh, Acts 17 that, you know, Paul, that many Jews became Christians. Most likely more did after this. And Paul just got done praising these people, right? Saying how he thanks God constantly for them. Not something that he would simply do if he was just anti-Jewish as a race or an ethnicity. Consideration number four, you need to consider Paul's heart for the Jewish people as reflect, reflected elsewhere in scripture. You know, it's, this is a big one too, because uh, even if Paul weren't Jewish, like it would be impossible to read what he writes in the New Testament without just seeing his, his love for the, for the Jewish people, for his love for his fellow Jews, his genuine yearning for them to see Jesus as their Messiah and turn to him and, and, and find life. You know, this, it, this love just jumps out of Paul's other letters. Read Romans 11. You know, you can't, you can't read that and think that Paul is an anti-Jewish racist. He loves, he loves these people. Or read the, the book of Acts, you know, where, where Paul's method, his, he always goes, when he gets to a new city or whatever, first place he goes is the synagogue. First, first place he goes is to his, his own people, the Jews, to, to, to reason with them from the scriptures and try to convince them that Jesus is the Christ. This is the actions of, these are the actions of a man who loves his fellow Jews, not someone who hates them. We need to read these words here in that context. And then final consideration, number five, and again, this is an important one. You need to consider Paul's personal history, especially for this subset of Jews that he's critiquing in Judea. Because the, I mean, the, the great irony of this list of sins right here is that if you go back like 15, 20 years, they, they would describe Paul to a T. Paul himself, I mean, you want to talk about someone who opposed the gospel. You want to talk about someone who was just, who was driving Christians out and rounding them up and throwing them in jail and, and all these things. It was Paul, not, not Paul the apostle, but, but Paul the persecutor, Paul the, the zealot anti-Jesus Paul. So, I mean, you got to think that when Paul writes these words of judgment here, he, I mean, he doesn't do so lightly. He does so as, as one who himself, he calls himself the chief of sinners elsewhere. He, he knows he was the enemy of God's people. He writes all of this as one who barely escaped from the fire himself, and that only by God's grace. So, we need to read all of these words in that context, all five of those considerations. And having done so, I hope that we're ready to, to hear all of this as the Thessalonians would, which has a message of encouragement to people who are suffering. Now we're going to get to the actual meaning of this, the relevance of this for us today. Two key truths that Paul wants these Christians here in this, this community in Thessalonica to keep going, even in the face of suffering and hostility. Two truths that I hope we as a community can hear as well. Here's number one, is that you are not alone. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. Imitators meaning copiers, mimics, those who are following in the footsteps of another, not blazing their own trail. So key because I, I, I know it can be tempting to think when you're going through suffering or facing um, hostility, like, like these Christians are, you know, in this letter, that, that you're alone. You're alone in this. That, that what you're experiencing is, is totally new or, or unique or without precedent. And the danger in that kind of thinking then uh, is that when you're thinking along those lines, lines it's much easier to just give up and, and, and quit. You know, a sense of uh, isolation can lead easily to a sense of resignation or despair that you're alone in this, so why, why even keep going? Paul wants to guard against this misconception in the Thessalonians here by reminding them that they aren't alone in their suffering, not by a long shot, that this hostility they're facing is nothing new, that in fact, by suffering for the sake of God, they are joining in a long and noble lineage of people who have passed through the very same flames faithfully. That's what he wants them to see right here. That's what we need to see as well. Four ways Paul reminds the Thessalonians of this in this passage. Number one, they are imitators of their fellow Christians in the region of Judea. This would be uh, Judea, the area where Jesus walked and lived, greater Jerusalem. Basically, it's way down there on the map. 
You see where that is? And then Thessalonica, where Paul is writing to these Christians, is way up there. All right, Judea down there also, that would be where um, the, the, the first disciples of Jesus, the apostles, early chapters of Acts, this is where they first begin uh, proclaiming uh, the message of this new life in Jesus, the Messiah, and these new, you know, uh, Christian, uniquely Christian communities were forming all, all over this place. So it only makes sense that these churches here were the first to experience hostility and, and persecution for their identification with Jesus. Can, again, you can read all about this in the, in the early chapters of Acts, how these Christians were beaten and scattered, rounded up, thrown into prison, all of that. Again, ironically by Paul. You gotta also think, you know, when he writes this, he's thinking firsthand of this persecution of the churches in Judea that he himself inflicted on them. He saw their faithfulness. He saw their suffering because he was the one who was leading them into it. And I think the reason Paul brings this up here is because he wants to remind these Christians in Thessalonica that what they're experiencing right now is not without precedent. In fact, that they are suffering the same things that these other Christians suffered on the, on the other side of the, sleep, of the sea, them from their fellow Jews. This was, you know, uh, Jewish people persecuting Jewish Christians in Judea, but these Thessalonians from their own countrymen, Paul emphasizes, from their fellow Greeks. That's a unique form of rejection. When you are not just getting rejected by some group you consider wholly other, but you're getting rejected by your own people, the people you, you identified with prior to Jesus. That's a unique form of pain and suffering that both the Jewish Christians in Judea had to face, and now the uh, Greek Christians in Thessalonica are having to face rejection from their own people. See the parallels between you and the Christians in Judea, Paul is telling them. See that you are not alone in your suffering, that they have walked in this before you and be inspired by that. Second way, Paul reminds these Thessalonians that they are not alone in their suffering. He points them to the suffering of Jesus, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, he says, but focus first on Jesus. Huge theme in the New Testament. I wish we could really unfold this here, but this is just a strategic reminder from Paul to these people that Jesus himself was not exempt from suffering or, or persecution or rejection or hostility. That in fact, he knows what they are going through personally. You know, we read early on in the Gospel of John that he came to his own, his own people, but his own did not receive them. This rejection from your own people. And Jesus culminated in death. He suffered to an extent that, that we can't even fathom. And the reassurance in Hebrews is that then we have a great and sympathetic high priest who knows what we are going through intimately, personally. This is just a subtle reminder of that right here to the Thessalonians that Jesus himself suffered and died. Reminder number three, that they're not alone in their suffering. The Thessalonians, they're not only suffering in solidarity with Christians right now on the other side of the sea, and they're not only suffering in solidarity with Jesus who suffered before them, but they are also suffering with generations of God's people past, specifically the prophets. You know, all through the Old Testament, you, you can read about the rejection and the hostility that God's messengers endured all the way back from Moses on through. Like anyone who spoke faithfully for God, they were receiving rejection for it, often from their own people. You know, what you see when you, when you look at this in the larger context that Paul is again hinting at right here, you see that, you know, suffering for God's people, it's nothing new. If anything, it's the norm. It, it's to be expected or anticipated if you're being faithful to God. We shouldn't be, you know, caught off guard today or surprised um, when people don't like the message of God or the message of Jesus and despise us, despise our message. This has been going on for as long as God has ever had messengers. Then reminder number four, it's a reminder they're not alone in their suffering because Paul and his companions have gone through suffering too. They drove us out, as he puts it. Like he said back in chapter one, he said, you became imitators of us and the Lord when you received the word in much affliction. So imitators of Paul, imitators of Jesus, we all suffered persecution. You're suffering persecution too. You're not alone. That's what Paul's saying here. Again, you know, all of this is so important for us to remember as, as, as Christians today in, in the United States, if we sense that we're beginning to feel more and more hostility toward us as people or us or, or our message, it's important it's important to hear all this, what Paul is saying here, because it should keep us from freaking out 
You know, it should, it should uh, keep us from overestimating the uniqueness of our situation when we face some hostility. And it should also keep us from underestimating our ability to endure or even thrive in the face of hostility and, and persecution, like so many Christians have throughout history. They've, they've endured, they've grown, they've thrived like the Thessalonians are, like so many Christians are right now throughout the world, faithfully suffering for Jesus. So I guess there's two practical ways I want to emphasize right here before we move on, two practical ways that we could put this reminder from Paul into practice right here for us as a congregation in our own hearts. One would be to gain a historical perspective on our suffering. And the second would be to gain a global perspective on our suffering, okay? A historical perspective, a global perspective. We're gonna need both of those if we are gonna see our own situation clearly in its proper context and light. So the historical perspective, what that's gonna do is that it's gonna keep us, again, from thinking that our situation here is entirely new or, or novel. And, and, and the global perspective is gonna remind us that we're not alone, that in fact, Christians around the world have it, have it much worse than we do. So much more I wish I could could say about this, but you know, one, one very practical way to gain this uh, historical perspective is to read Christian biography, to read the stories of, of Christians who have come before us, how they suffered faithfully. You know, this is why Bruce just a few weeks ago was, you know, throwing out $20 bills like they were Monopoly money. You guys remember that? There was cash all over the stage for, for young people. It was like one of those machines where the, it's blowing the cash on, you can just grab it. Many of you got $20 bills. I hope you bought that biography because he did all that because he wanted you to buy that huge book that, that had all these stories of faithful Christians in the past. All these stories of people who suffered for the sake of Jesus in, in, in previous generations and were faithful. We, we need that perspective today. We need to see our, our ancestors in the faith, faith and find inspiration for our faithfulness right here, right now, with whatever challenges we might face. That's the, that's the historical perspective that all of us need. And then the global perspective that all of us need. You know, if we find ourselves getting uncomfortable with this realization that we may be holding to more and more of a minority view on many things, in our culture because of our faithfulness to Jesus, that maybe uh, the, the, what, what feels like the, the numbers of antagonists are potentially growing and growing all around us. If we, if we feel that concern, then we have much, much to learn from our brothers and sisters around the world, from a, from a sister like, like Karen Dubois, you know, who was sent out from this very congregation several decades ago to minister and share the message of Jesus in the city of Izmir, Turkey, population 4.6 million, 200,000 of which are professing Christians by, by generous estimates, fewer than 6%. And then on the flip side of that, where, where Karen lives and ministers, the, the 90 plus percent uh, Muslim majority looks on these Christians with suspicion at best. You know, sometimes... Uh, Outright hostility in the case of the, the evangelist who was uh, stabbed to death, the Christian evangelist stabbed to death in, in 2019 or in uh, 2007. Three young uh, owners of a Bible publishing business were, I'm, this is an awful story. Uh, it made international headlines. They were brutally tortured and murdered in their shop for no other reason than that they were running a Bible publishing business. You know, these Christians on the other side of the globe have something to teach us here in, in Tacoma. These are the Christians we need to learn to become imitators of, perhaps, just like the Thessalonians became imitators of those in Judea, hundreds of miles away and across the sea. This is part of the reason that, you know, we as a church make journeys to Liberia when we have the opportunity or to Nicaragua or elsewhere around the world. It's to learn from our brothers and sisters in Christ in very different contexts than we are right now, to see their faith in Jesus lived out in suffering more, more often than not in very difficult conditions. And then we need to learn how to become imitators of them right here on the east side of Tacoma. That's why we need this perspective. That's the first reminder Paul gives here to Christians in suffering. You're not alone. Second big reminder Paul gives them 
God will bring you justice. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. This, this part of the passage here almost has like a courtroom feel to it, doesn't it? Like here is the, you know, the prosecuting attorney, Paul, and he's laying out all of the charge and then he pronounces the verdict. So let's, let's look at the, the charges here. These, these list of five specific sins that Paul lays at the feet of these persecutors in, in, in Judea. One, they killed the Lord Jesus. Two, they killed the prophets. Three, they drove us out. They kicked us out of this, this, this region. Four, they displeased God. That's actually a really big one. We're not going to unpack it, but that's a big deal in Paul's perspective. And then five, they oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that, may be, that they may be saved. And this one right here, I mean, that is just inexcusable, indefensible in Paul's sight. These people who are hindering Paul and his companions, they're like, they're like somebody like intentionally blocking a fire truck on its way to a burning building or someone who sees paramedics rushing to the scene of an accident and they tackle them to keep them from, from, from helping the victims because in doing this, they are hindering those who hold in their possess possession the singular message that can heal all mankind. The singular message that can bring all person, any, any person to life in Jesus. The only message that can save our lost and dying world. And instead of helping the messengers, instead of aiding them on their way, they're trying to block them and thereby blocking all mankind from their only hope of salvation. This is awful. For this reason, and for all the reasons lifted, listed above, these people are the objects of God's wrath. And therein, ironically, lies the encouragement for the Thessalonians and for Paul and for for any Christians anywhere who suffer at the hands of God's enemies, God will bring you justice, Paul is saying. Or as he puts it here, they do all this so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. Another temptation for people who are going through suffering as a, as a follower of Jesus is to begin to wonder you know, is God aware of what we're going through? Does he know about this? Does, does he see, does he care? You know, this is especially true if the suffering persists for some time with, with no end in sight. Maybe it's even getting worse. Are you there, God? Do you care? That's the suffering Christian might wonder as it's often voiced in the Psalms. This is why it's so important to hear what God, what, what Paul says here about God as a promise and especially, I think that metaphor right there of the measure of their sins that Paul references. This is a metaphor that Paul is um, borrowing from the Old Testament where it's used several times to describe this mysterious way in which God allows a certain degree of evil to persist before he responds in judgment. It's kind of like, the, the, again, the metaphor here, it's like God is watching a cup filling up, and he is uh, waiting for it to fill up all the way. With each act of violence, each act of hatred, each act of antagonism, this cup's getting a little higher, a little higher, until it reaches the point where only God knows, which God has already established his standard, when God's justice will then be triggered, when he will then respond in vengeance for his people, or when, as Paul puts it, wrath comes upon them at last, or in the end, or fully, as the New American Standard Bible puts it, or to the uttermost, as we read in the NKJV. This, those last few words are actually pretty hard to translate. Another one where you've got quite a few options. This certainly means, we know from Paul's other writings, Paul's thinking about, you know, the end, the uttermost, at last, meaning the day of the Lord, when all people everywhere, living and dead, will be judged before the throne of God. But, you know, in the case here, Paul sees this as having already happened, Somehow, he makes it very clear the rest of the, the, this letter and the next, that the day of the Lord has not yet come, he says to these Christians in Thessalonica. So he's talking about a past tense, something that has already happened. This wrath has come upon them. 
and where, you know, so I think Paul's talking about a historical event here, something that has already happened temporally to these persecutors in Judea that, that, that is an expression of God's wrath and foreshadows his ultimate wrath to come. And when you think about this time period, you know, Paul's writing this likely in the late 40s, early 50s. There was, I mean, there was a lot of candidates for historical events that could have, Paul could have had in mind here. Judea was um, under the rule of a governor here named Ventidius Cuminus, and he was just an awful dude, a, a butcher in, in many ways, this Roman overlord over the Jews. And he, very, Paul very well could be looking at him as an instrument of God's wrath on these persecutors. Uh, you know, right now, one, one of the most notable bad things, this is a good candidate for the wrath Paul might be thinking of here, was under the rule, again, of Governor Cuminus when Passover time, so you got thousands and thousands of Jews, you know, streaming into Jerusalem. The city is packed from people all over the place. And on, on the walls of the, the fortress that overlooked the temple, one of the Roman guards exposed himself to the Jewish pilgrims there, shouting out mockery and insults to them, which then caused a major riot, right? Naturally, they're upset. So what does Governor Cuminus do? He sends in the troops who began to slaughter. And according to Josephus, 20 to 30,000 Jewish people died in this. That number may be inflated, but it just gives you an idea that this was an absolute bloodbath. There were other similar events at this time that, that Paul could have been seen as this is an expression of God's judgment against the Jewish leadership that was uh, persecuting these Christians. But regardless of what he has in mind, the, the encouragement to the Thessalonians and to us is clear. It's that God does indeed know what you are going through and he will bring you justice in the end. He will. This is, this is so, promised so many times in scripture. And, and we need to remember this if we are persecuted. We remember this if this persecution persists with, with, with no end in sight. There is a God who sees all things. And no one who does evil can escape his wrath, either in this life or the life to come. God will bring you justice. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanksgiving. That's really, I mean, really that is the note that we need to end on here. Not all this, you know, all about the, the, the wrath, the judgment, the dark, but, but, but thanksgiving to God. Again, that's, that's what's driving this. It's easy to forget it with all this talk about judgment at the end and the sins of, of these persecutors and all that, but this is a happy passage, <laughs> in our Bibles, right? This is Paul expressing joy and thanksgiving. It's, it, it, it's not a kick in the behind. It is a pat on the shoulder of, 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 of encouragement and a hand clap of celebration for the work that God has done in these people. I want us to look at that first verse uh, just, just once again, because I, I want us to see how all of this uh, fits together, how Paul's view of their suffering and what they're going through actually leads him to, to worship and thanksgiving. Verse 13, he says, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but what as it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For, and this is Paul's explanation for all this now, how he knows and how he's convinced that God really is at work in these believers, that, that, that right now, through his word, that all of this is really real. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea for you suffered. Do you see how that, those connections there highlighted by the words for? Do you, do you see why Paul's so happy? It's because he has seen these people suffering. That's what makes him want to worship. That's what wants to make him, you know, rejoice in Thanksgiving. It's almost ironic when you put it that way, isn't it? It almost makes Paul sound kind of uh, sadistic. If Paul sees their suffering, so he rejoices. Paul sees them going through this hostility and this, and this violence and, and, and all that, and it makes him want to then thank God and worship. Yes. Yes, it does. Not because Paul is rejoicing in their hardship, but because he's rejoicing in their faithfulness. Their faithfulness in suffering, that is the unquestionable confirmation that God is really at work in them, that they truly belong to Jesus, that no, Paul's work has not been in vain. It is bearing fruit beautifully, even in the harshest conditions. 
Have you ever felt this joy? This joy that, that Paul expresses right here in Thanksgiving, this joy of seeing a brother or a sister in Christ suffer faithfully. Have you ever felt that? I have. I do right now. I do right now, looking out at you and, and knowing some of the stories of, of what you have faced as, as individuals and as families and the fact that some of you are even just sitting here this morning and you're still walking with Jesus. That's beautiful. You know, I mentioned last week that one of the, the deepest joys of eternity is going to be seeing each other glorified, completed. The work of, you know, the work of salvation finished in us, shining like, you know, Roman candles. It's going to be beautiful. Well, I'll tell you right now, one of the deepest joys of life together in Jesus here, now, right, right now in a church family, is seeing one another suffer faithfully. Because this is the confirmation that God is really at work in you. That God is really active through the gospel right here in this church. And, and then we see that in the life of another person. It makes us want to worship in Thanksgiving. That's what, that's what Paul is modeling for us right here. A model I don't want us to miss in all these you know, details of the text. Paul is modeling this type of worship that begins by looking at another believer and it ends by looking to God in worship. Have you experienced that? You know, for you younger people here especially, I will say this is why it is so rich and deep and wonderful to make the effort to join a local church and really be involved in it. You know, not kind of a shallow community, but a thick community. This community, that's like a family of, of people who don't hide their suffering or, or sugarcoat it, but people who, who share their suffering with one another. A fellowship in a thick, robust sense. Not fellowship, you know, like eating donuts in the fireside room, as much as I love that, but fellowship, you know, more like fellowship of the ring, right? This brotherhood that, that's leaning on each other. That, that needs each other for a dark and dangerous journey through the world. And what a rich joy it is for me, having grown up in this church, you know, having been here my, my entire life, I, just to think about my time in the small group I grew up in with my parents week after week and the prayer requests that people shared, the things they were going through, and the fact that those people are still here, still here walking faithfully with Jesus. That is beautiful. It is a true blessing of really being in a local church and making the effort to build those relationships because this is, it's not just going to happen. It's not just going to, you know, magically come to, you know, it takes work to, to kind of build those kind of relationships, especially with people who are different than you. But it's so worth it because you can have the deep joy that Paul expresses here, the joy of seeing another Christian suffer and knowing that through it all, they are walking with Jesus and Jesus is walking with them. That is, that is beautiful. So let's, let's pray together now. Let's think about each other and then let's worship our God who is at work within us. Praise the Lord. Father, we do thank you so much for your spirit. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your word and these precious reminders to us that can sustain us even in the face of hostility, even in the face of suffering. Thank you, Father, for the good gifts that you have given us. It's hard not to be anxious when we think about the future. It's hard not to be anxious when we know all the unknowns and the, the, just the difficulty of life and add on to that potentially hostility from, from other people, Lord. We need you. We need your work in us if we're going to stay faithful. So we ask you for that, Father. We thank you for what you've already given us. We thank you for what you've already done here in this church community. And we ask humbly that by your spirit, through your word, through the, the wonderful hope of the gospel and the work of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would please continue that good work in us and help us be a faithful church family. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray all of this. Amen.